one of the most crazy making yet widespread and potentially dangerous notions is, oh, that behavior is genetic. Now what does that mean? It means all sorts of subtle stuff if you sort of know modern biology, but for most people out there, what it winds up meaning is, ah, uh, a deterministic view of life, one rooted in biology and genetics, genes equal things that can't be changed. Genes equal things that are inevitable and that you might as well not waste resources trying to fix, might as well not put societal energies into trying to improve because it's inevitable, it's unchangeable. And that is sheer nonsense. It is widely thought that uh, conditions like ADHD are genetically programmed, conditions like schizophrenia are genetically programmed. The truth is the opposite. Nothing is genetically programmed. There are very rare diseases, I mean a small handful, extremely um, sparsely represented in the population that are truly genetically determined. Most complex conditions might have a predisposition that is a genetic component, but a predisposition is not the same as a predetermination. The whole uh, search for the source of diseases in the genome uh, was doomed to failure before anybody even thought of it, because most diseases are not genetically predetermined. Heart disease, cancer, strokes, um, uh, rheumatoid conditions, autoimmune conditions in general, um, mental health conditions, addictions, these are none of them genetically determined. Uh, breast cancer, for example, out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will carry the breast cancer genes. 93 do not. And out of 100 women who do have the genes, not all of them will get cancer. Genes are not just things that make us behave in a particular way regardless of our environment. Genes give us different ways of responding to our environment. Um, and, uh, in fact, it looks as if some of the early childhood influences of the kind of child-rearing uh, affect gene expression, actually turning on and off different genes um, to put you on a different development, developmental track, which may suit the kind of world you've got to deal with. So, for example, uh, a study done in Montreal uh, with suicide victims looked at autopsies of the brains of these people. And it turned out that if a suicide victim, these are usually young adults, had been abused as children, the abuse actually caused a genetic change in the brain that was absent in the brains of people who had not been abused. But that's an epigenetic effect. Epi means on top of, so that, so that the epigenetic influence is what happens environmentally to either uh, activate or deactivate certain genes. In New Zealand, there's a study that was done in a town called Dunedin, um, in which uh, a few thousand individuals were studied from birth up to their, into their 20s. What they found was that they could identify a genetic mutation, an abnormal gene, which did have some relation to the predisposition to commit violence but only if the individual had also been subjected to severe child abuse. In other words, a child with this abnormal gene would be no more likely to be violent than anybody else. And in fact, they actually had a lower rate of violence than people with normal genes, as long as they weren't abused as children. Great additional example of the ways in which genes are not be all end all. Fancy technique where you can take a specific gene out of a mouse, that mouse and its descendants will not have that gene, you have knocked out that gene. So there's this one gene that codes for a protein that has something to do with learning and memory, and this fabulous demonstration, knock out that gene and you have a mouse that doesn't learn as well. Ooh, a genetic basis for intelligence. What was much less appreciated in that landmark study that got picked up by the media left and right is take those genetically impaired mice and raise them in a much more enriched, stimulating environment than your normal mice in a lab cage, and they completely overcame that deficit. So 
when one says in a contemporary sense that, oh, this behavior is genetic, to the extent that that's even a valid sort of phrase to use, what you're saying is there is a genetic contribution to how this organism responds to environment. Genes may influence the readiness with which an organism will deal with a certain environmental challenge. You know, that's not the version most people have in their minds. And not to be too soapboxing, but run with the old sort of version of it's genetic and it's not that far from a history of eugenics and things of that sort. Um, it's a widespread misconception and it's a potentially fairly dangerous one. One reason that the sort of biological explanation for violence, uh, one reason that hypothesis is potentially dangerous, it's not just misleading, it can really do harm, is because if you believe that, you could very easily say, well, there's nothing we can do to change the predisposition people have to becoming violent. All we can do if somebody becomes violent is punish them, you know, lock them up or execute them. But we don't need to worry about changing the social environment or the social preconditions that may lead people to become violent because that's irrelevant. The genetic argument allows us the luxury of ignoring past and present historical and social factors. And in the words of uh, Louis Menard, you wrote in the New Yorker, very astutely he said, it's all in the genes, an explanation for the way things are that does not threaten the way things are. Why should someone feel unhappy or engage in antisocial behavior when that person is living in the freest and most prosperous nation on earth? It can't be the system. There must be a flaw in the wiring somewhere, which is a good way of putting it. So the genetic argument is simply a cop-out, uh, which allows us to ignore the social and uh, economic and political factors that, in fact, underlie um, many uh, troublesome behaviors. Addictions are usually uh, considered to be a drug-related issue, but looking at it more broadly, I define addiction as any behavior that is associated with uh, craving, with temporary relief, and with long-term negative consequences, along with an impairment of control over it, so that the person wishes to give it, give it up or promises to do so, but can't follow through. And when you understand that, then you can see that there are many more addictions than simply those related to drugs. So there's workaholism, there's addiction to shopping, to the internet, to video games. There's the addiction to power. People have power, but they want more and more and more. Nothing is ever enough for them. Uh, acquisition, corporations that must own more and more. The addiction to oil, but at least to the wealth and to the products made accessible to us by oil. Look at the negative consequences on the environment. Uh, now very, we're destroying the very earth that we inhabit for the sake of that addiction. Now these addictions are far more devastating in their social consequences than the cocaine or heroin habits of my downtown Eastside patients. Yet they're rewarded and considered to be respectable. The tobacco company executive that shows a higher profit will get a much bigger reward. He doesn't face any negative consequences legally or otherwise. In fact, he's a respected member of the board of several other corporations. But tobacco smoke related diseases kill five and a half million people around the world every year. Uh, in the United States, they kill 400,000 people a year. And these people are addicted to what? To profit. To such a degree are they they're addicted that they're actually in denial about the impact of their uh, activities, which is typical for addicts, is denial. And that's a respectable one. It's respectable to be addicted to profit no matter what the cost. So what is acceptable and what is respectable is a highly arbitrary phenomenon in our society. And it seems like the greater the harm, the more respectable the addiction. There's a general myth that drugs in themselves are addictive. In fact, the war on drugs is predicated on the idea that if you interdict the sources of drugs, you can deal with addiction that way. Now, um, if we understand addiction in a broader sense, we see that nothing in itself is addictive. No substance, no drug is by itself addictive, and no 